Hello, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Courtney Miller. I, I specialize in play therapy, and I know a lot of people do not, or a lot of parents do not really understand um, the gist of it. And I want to kind of share that and also with um, adults because it can be used for adults and teens. And it is very amazing. So I would like, I'm glad that some of you are here today. Um, and at the end, there will be time for some questions and everything if anyone has any. And I'll send you along with some things for you to try as well. I started counseling in 2013 um, for my practicum and internship at Family Nurturing Center, Colorado, in, which is in the Springs, which focuses on mental health in regards to families and children. And that was actually the first time that I learned about play therapy. Because um, when I was in school, they did not teach us that at all. And what was really interesting is I just kind of really connected with that um, more than I think anything else. So, um, and then during my counseling career, I was also taught, or during that time, I was also taught a lot about CBT and which is cognitive play, behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. And, um, but right now we're going to be really focusing on play therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy allows people to focus on, um, or at least the way I use it, challenging their thoughts and behaviors. And so they are able to um, challenge or catch themselves and then ask themselves if that is actually what they want to do. Um, and then they're able to go from then on. And I always make sure I let them know that it will not happen overnight. And that's also what um play therapy because parents will see them and a lot of times kids will just be playing and they're asking why is my child just playing how is this supposed to be really helping them at home well it does the biggest issue is that the parents have to trust the child because parents will talk we'll talk during like um our therapy and everything, but kids do not know exactly know how to do that. And then I began counseling with Well Minded in 2019. And that is where I really specialize um, with play therapy, CBT, um, DBT, EMDR, um, and families and couples. I started to study, like I mentioned, I'm sorry, my play therapy during my practicum and internship, and I just really connected with them. And then I have completed um, play therapy training in 2020. Um, I took that time when um, COVID hit to kind of catch up on a lot of things that we had been going on. And I learned a lot of more stuff about it that I could share. And I also learned how I could take it online. And that actually was really interesting because I did not know that I would be able to do play therapy online. Um, and play therapy can be used with families and individuals as well. I personally specialize with the individuals. Um, play therapy with families is a little more interesting. Um, it usually is more for, like it mentions down on the bottom, for people who have more difficulty with communication. 
um, with autism or trauma and they need to find ways that they can communicate. And that is where it comes in with like adults or again, children. Um, they're able to find ways to communicate that way with their parents or significant others. And the anxiety and divorce, abuse, trauma, and autism. And divorce is one of the main things that I really focus on with play therapy. Um, parents do not remember what it is like when it is when they are a child. Um, and there's a lot of times parents will put the child in the middle. And the kid is feels like they're torn. The parents do not understand why the kid starts acting up. So they tell the kid they need to go to therapy. Well, at therapy, there are a couple of ways, which I'll discuss in a moment, um, that we use. I either allow the child to decide what they want to focus on when they come in or I decide what we will um, really focus on. We'll either have things set up and I'll ask them how they're feeling that day, um, how things went on that day, and then we'll try and um, work out what could have helped. I also have um, one of the big things, and this works with anger and anxiety, we make um, a little toy that they can shake when they get really mad or anxious. And so we spend some time doing that. Uh, and there's games that they we can also set up. A lot, most of the time though, I allow the kid to decide. With divorce, I ha do have, we draw. This is really, sometimes they feel guilty about this. But I ask them what a family looks like to them or what they feel like they can eat, have from each family or each household. That way they know that they can feel um, love with each one. They can feel whole in each ha home. It is a form of uh, psychotherapy that uses play instead of communication to determine and overcome psychosocial challenges. It helps clients towards better growth and development, social integration, decreased aggression like anger, social skill development, empathy, and trauma resolution. I do really enjoy working with the trauma and this is where I first came across it and noticed how much it really helps. Um, during my internship, most of the children I worked with had been abused when they were like really mm, four, three, four years old. And they, of course, did not know how to describe it or even want to talk about it. So they would show it through play. They would take dolls um, and act out what they had been experiencing. Or they would use a sand um, and have a little uh, play it out and they would bury it. And at first it gets, it's really harsh. But as they come to it and feel that they are accepting of it and feeling like they are getting better it's not that hard anymore they are not hurting those dolls anymore they're not hurting those army men anymore or burying those army men anymore or if they're fighting you they're not wanting to kill you anymore or have you harm them anymore and that's how you are able to see that they are progressing a little bit more and more. Everything doesn't have to hide. And things are able to help each other after a while. 
And the better growth and development is a big thing that goes on with um, autism. I really enjoyed, and I'm working on that right now as well. Um, they are finding a way for better communication. They're learning how to communicate more, telling you um, what is okay, what is not okay, how to handle their anger more. And with this, a lot of times we, in a weird way, play house. So that way they learn um, what to share, what not to share, how to discuss that they this is theirs instead of fighting their siblings about it. And that also with school, that's a big one. Because when kids want to argue and everything at home, they feel that they can do that at school too. And we use tools like playhouse, sandbox, dolls, um, for us to find out the main cause of disturbed behavior. One of my favorite is a lot of times we um, paint and kids will, especially from torn homes or broken homes, I should say not torn, um, will start stating that if there's a tornado. And what that means is that there's a lot of difficulty going on in their homes, in their life, whether it's at school or in their house, and they don't have any control over it. And they don't have to state that. They're showing that right there and they're getting it out. And they can use certain bears or even um, I don't know what it either or I three D things that are now really big. Um, and luckily, one of my coworkers makes a lot of those. Kids love those, and they decide which ones are going to be the bad guys. Well, they don't know that. Um, and it's been proven a lot of those, they're trying to state that that is what is evil to them. And they're stating, I do not feel safe right now. If they're going to play the bad guys, they want to get back at everybody else. They want to feel strong. And so while they're in there doing that, it might look like they're just playing, but they are actually feeling stronger. And so when they leave and go home, they feel more comfortable and stronger than when they came in. Now, this is what I was talking about just a couple of minutes ago. The two main branches are non-directive and directive. Non-directive is where you allow the child to decide what they want to do as soon as they come in. They have complete control over what they're going to do whether they want to play with the dolls, whether they want to play a game or draw, and whether they want you to be involved in any of that. Um, and you just let them do that. The directive is where you plan it out. I mean, where, like if I, like I mentioned, I have things, um, where they build stuff. Um, some of my autistic kids, I'll have them make, make masks to try and discuss what kind of mood they're in. Instead of stating, they'll say, I'm mad today, or I'm happy. Or um, we'll discuss it at the beginning of every session. I ask them, okay, how, how did you feel during this week? And why? How did you handle it? 
So, and then after that, then we go through non, then they get to choose what they want to do. Um, I try always to start with um, both, but if the kid really wants to just control it, then we'll go to them having the complete control and they're the non-directed. Then we just do the non-directive. And a lot of times parents feel very uncomfortable about that because they're wondering, what is my kid getting out of this? Um, so I have to sit there and discuss with them. And I ask them, do you see what they're coming home with? Is it any different? And a lot of times they do. And I have to talk to them because um, the parents do have to do homework as well. They have to... And I try meeting with them a couple of times a month, um, telling them, hey, the kid is working here. You need to try and um, work on this. They're not, you know, if the kids say, one of the kids I worked with had an anger issue. So I was like, this is what they're going to do. This is how they're going to handle their, if they're angry, they're going to take a deep breath. They're going to punch a pillow instead of punching the wall, something like that. I know that's not perfect for you, but can you please allow them to do that? Or if they want to go to their room, if they're upset, um, and then we'll just continue going from there, let them grow. Um, because if they don't, then it's going to continue staying in square one. And then uh, I already discussed the directive approach and the non-directive, but the techniques are creative visualization um, where we've they make the thing that they're seeing that they want you to see. We'll draw it out. We'll play it out. Um, storytelling, which I will have the kid play what they are feeling, what they want to tell. They can do it however they want. And I just go along with them. I ask them. And if they tell me, no, you're wrong, then I say, okay, well, then you tell me. What do you want me to play as? Or you tell me what's going on. Who is doing what? It also goes into role playing. That they love doing. Most of the time in the beginning, they play the victim and then after a while they become who is taking over because they start feeling stronger and then the toy phones and the puppets are ways that they can also feel stronger they feel that they are no longer themselves they so they can talk to whoever they want communicate however they want. So they have you be the person that they want to communicate, like if it's their bully at school or their parents, and they'll practice communicating with them or they'll tell you what happened. They'll open up that way. And then they can practice how they can heal or what they might be able to do. And they can see that they are no longer in pain. And then the arts and crafts are what I discussed a little bit ago. I do this especially with kids who are going through divorce. Um, they're able to see that they still have two homes, but they can see the positives in both. They can see how everything is still growing. Um, and if they need to write down the negatives, they can write those down so they can get it out. I also, they also like making things. While they're talking, sometimes it really helps them to talk. 
That also goes along with the blocks and the construction toys. We have a game that there's questions written on it, and so they'll have to why they poke them, poke them out, and then they'll ask the question. They have to answer it. And for a while, a couple of them were like, they didn't want to. They didn't want to go first. But I've, since I've been seeing them for a while, I like to challenge them. Or they didn't know how to answer it. And so I will have them, I'll allow them to put it on the side and pick another one. But then we have to go to that one after afterwards. With that situation, I understand why, because of what's going on. But I want to work with that kid and help them really build up. And the dancing and the creative movement, a lot of kids really work with that. I should have also put um, makeup in here too, because um, I've started seeing that they found that I have makeup um, and they start, they like using that to start finding who they are, that they can be themselves and they'll put that on, they'll dance and um, feel more themselves in there than they do at school or during the week and they'll open up more. And that's also where musical play comes in. A couple of them have started bringing in little drums and stuff and have other people sing along and um, it helps them. They'll bring their, this kid will bring his mom in and it helps him open up and handle everything a lot easier than before where he would get really upset and yell at her. And so that is the biggest thing that we have really noticed about play therapy with these two is that as long as he has the room and he can do what he wants, it helps him open up and communicate really well with her. And I kind of already discussed that as well, that it can be taken home to strengthen the relationships with the family. I'm sorry, I'm not going through each one as I should. I just start talking. I want to discuss a little bit more about the role playing. So, because it is, um, it is a better emotional experience. The kid can change it however they want. So in a way, they can also see that they have control still over their life. So if they want to play out what is happening right now, what's going on, in a way, they can change it. They can put everything in a mental box and I always discuss with them what it is and they can change the situation they can see they can make it so that way they have control over it they can be the they can win they can be the good guy like if somebody is harming them, how can they change that so that way they no longer have to be taking that anymore? How can they leave therapy and still feel safe, still feel okay and go on with their life? So they're able to change the story. And that is also kind of what role playing is to them.
Now, this is kind of what goes into kids with autism, teens, adults, the sensory play. Um, I know I only put a anxiety, but a lot of times um, I'm having kids with autism that come in and they use this a lot, especially Play-Doh and slime. They love that. Um, I think the reason I put anxiety is because we make the stuff. We're helping them calm down and then they take it home. So this is something that everybody can try. Making the slime is a lot of fun. It's fun to make. It's fun to try. And while they're making it and stretching it, allow them to laugh about it, allow them to talk about whatever they want, have them discuss how it feels, have them discuss with them how it can help them relax. And at home, talk to the parents about that and Play-Doh. I know some schools actually allow um, kids to bring the stuff in. So if they need to have them do that. Um, bubbles are really good. I have some kids that like to just walk around outside um, and talk. And now that it's the summer, we've been doing that. We'll walk around and we'll play, um, we'll do bubbles. And they start laughing and they'll open up and they'll, they'll even bring it in and just ask if we can go for a walk. As I mentioned that um, it does work with adults a lot. The main reason way that it does work with adults is learning disabilities. Um, I have not worked with many people with dementia, but I've heard that it can help with that. Chronic illness, it does help a lot. Um, substance use. It allows people to not feel as guilty to kind of get back on track with what's going on. With if they feel guilt or anything, they could get back with what's going on. Same thing with trauma and physical abuse, just like I mentioned with kids. Same thing with whether it's a teen or adult. PTSD, exact same thing. You're going to have to get, those thoughts are going to be there and bother you. You're going to have to, you can use this stuff to find ways to move on. And if you don't want to talk about it with anybody or you don't know how to talk about it with anybody, a lot of these things that I just discussed, whether drawing, acting it out, um, some of the things that you can make, a lot of it really works. And there are so many people with play therapy that prefer to work with adults than with kids. And I believe the unresolved childhood issues kind of falls into the trauma and everything. Um, but it is amazing the way that this can work. Um, this works. And if you don't feel like you can open up to your significant other or anything, or they wouldn't understand, this is an amazing um, way. EMDR does help, um, but I personally believe that if you're not comfortable with that, the play therapy can work too. And like I said, if you have trouble opening up the dramatic role playing, it helps keep in touch with feelings that are hard to talk about. 
you put the therapist in there and you act it out. Therapists are trained to do what you want them to. Whether you want them to be the bad guy or the good guy, you tell them what to do, whether they die or they're the ones that hurt you. And they, they play it out. And that really, it helps. A lot of times art therapy and music therapy can help reveal hidden traumas and promote healing. Art therapy, I use art therapy a lot with play therapy. And this can this works wonders with um people of all ages. They draw things out that they didn't even know they were feeling. And you point things out and you ask them to discuss it with you. You ask them what they're trying to say, whether it's colors or um way things look, and have them discuss it to you. And then you can go from there. Whether it's that they're feeling alone, they are wanting, they feel lonely, they feel dead inside, they want to be dead. And I'm only mentioning that because I've had recently had this happen and I've um, had to handle schools with this. Um, but the main thing is never automatically assume that they are going to act on it because the art looks like that it's how they're feeling and then you work from there of course you set up a goal you know making sure that they're okay that they're not wanting to act on it automatically but then you go from there what helping them And then if you have any questions regarding any of this, please feel free to contact me. Here's my email address. And then we can you can also find us at wellmindedcounseling.com or you can call us. And then here are the resources. These are mainly for therapists. I mean, if you're interested at all, you're not, look these up. These are some of the things that I used um, today and they were really helpful. And then for parents and therapists or just anybody, um, this was what really, I really enjoyed. The Explosive Child, it was amazing. Um, I hope that that all came up okay. If there is any, if you had any other questions, please feel free to email me. And I would really like to get back to you. I hope that this answers a lot of your questions about play therapy and how it actually can help people of all ages. Um, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Right, have a good day.